you so much for inviting us. Uh, you know, we're gonna I'm gonna try to keep it uh, lighter on the content and you know be more of a question and answer session. Um, uh, my name is Dan Griffey, state representative, position number one in the 35th district. Uh, I live in Allen. I've been a lifelong Allen resident, and I've been to many North Mason Community Voice uh, meetings. Uh, we have a lot of good news about what's going on. Uh, the Highway 3 freight corridor, formerly known as the Belfort Bypass, is well on track. That's amazing. Um, we've been trying to get uh, a, a area to uh, a safe area to shoot the Tahuya Forest for many years. I hear back in the back over 25 years, and it looks like we might have a breakthrough on that. I'll let Drew talk about that because I don't want to. I don't want to uh, give all the fun. Uh, I, am, I currently serve as uh, House Republican Whip. Uh, both Drew and I made it into leadership this year, which is kind of unique, having uh, both members of the House leadership actually in House leadership. Uh, so that really helps uh, the consti or your consti our constituents. Um, I serve on the Mental Health Task Force. We do have a significant problem with mental health and uh, substance abuse. Uh, the legislature created another task force to, uh, to uh, work on that, and I was uh, appointed by the speaker to serve on that committee. I also serve on the uh, another statutory committee I sit on is the uh, uh, hmm. Correctional Industries Board. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, I like my work in Correctional Industries because uh, Correctional Industries uh, recidivism rate for graduates of Correctional Industries uh, is very low, uh, less than you know, less than thirty percent uh, recidivized. And um, we need to change our uh, our uh, state prison model to make sure that all prisoners are getting similar uh, programming, so we can make make sure that uh, we don't have a revolving door and that we are protecting people from uh, the ills of society. So with that, I'll stop now. Those are kind of the preview of things to go. Uh, and here's Drew. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having us tonight, uh, Drew McEwen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate uh, the opportunity. Look forward to hearing your questions. I'll just give a couple of high-level things, and we'll uh, we'll take your uh, your, your Q and A. Uh, I'm on, as Dan mentioned, I'm in leadership, and we both are. So two of these seven elected uh, uh, leaders are in this district, which is which is good for the 35th. Gives us a lot of uh, a lot of uh, pull. Um, additionally, I serve as the assistant ranking on appropriations which is the budget ranking committee for uh, for our state operating budget. And then I'm a ranking member on commerce and gaming, which is really fun. I like to refer to it as the vice squad. We deal with tobacco, alcohol, gambling, marijuana, and uh, some other occasional things that might come on uh, in relation to that. And it's, it's an interesting committee because it's really not partisan. Um, we all kind of have our weird algorithm on how we arrive at our answers on these. It doesn't come down to Republican or Democrat views necessarily. So it's kind of a fun committee that's uh, a little different than the, in the whole uh, context of the legislature. And then I also serve as the, uh, the co-chair of the uh, Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, which is a joint committee with, along with the Senate. Uh, as Dan mentioned, we've got a lot of positive things going on. One of the items, too, that we got out of the capital budget this past year is the, uh, the Belfair Sewer, and that is money to um, do, do the initial design work and uh, get it extended going into the South Kitsap Industrial Corridor. Which will provide more hookups, which will lower the uh, in the long term lower the rate uh, for those that are already hooked up, and that's uh, that is part of the overall plan is to continue to extend that towards Bremerton, and that is good for for this uh, uh, area again because it lowers the rates for everybody when you have more people coming on board. So, provide some additional financial stability to that system, and uh, that's it's not going to happen overnight, but we're moving in the right direction there. And as Dan mentioned, the the Belfair bypass is. Uh, is still on track. Um, we have to be vigilant with it and make sure that it stays on track. Uh, there's uh, $66 million and it's going through its final um, feedback right now. Next spring, the design happens on it and then they uh, officially break ground in 22 with a completion date of 2025. So the good news is we're closer than we've ever been, <laughs> the, uh, but we're not seeing it yet, uh, but we're getting there. And things, things as of today still are on track with that. Um, and then on the, uh, the, the shooting issue on the uh, DNR lands, um, Dan and, I, and uh, Senator Shelton have all been working on this over the years. And the conversation I had with uh, the DNR commissioner, uh, uh, or lands commissioner, excuse me, Hillary Franz, back in uh, July, um, she, uh, she promised to, to uh, uh, make sure that this is better addressed than it has been in years. And so there's going to be some agency requests legislation from them that will remove some state liability issues, which really is. Uh, ultimately what they're uh, uh, 
their biggest concern is. And so in doing that, it will be easier to designate certain areas to be uh, shooting areas and open that uh, to the public use. Or it is open to the public use, but make it more, uh, more obvious and, uh, and protect it to, uh, to be able to do that. So with that, I'd be happy to take any Looks questions. Like we got a question. No. Do you have a question? No. No. Oh. Look like that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, he's an EMT. He'll help you out. <laughs> On the uh, prison, the prison issue, I recently had a tour of the prison in Shelby, the state prison. Yeah. Uh, one of the comments was, I asked a question. Uh, I was impressed by the tour. I mean, it's something most people don't see. But I, I asked, does our, do our legislatures come through a tour? And the answer from their superintendent was, boy, I sure wish you could make that happen. Well, well he doesn't know uh, what happens, because I've been on three labor tours and four management tours. And I also sit on the public safety committee, which is the oversight committee for that. So uh, probably somebody that I didn't see when I was doing the tour, but we do it all the time. There are problems at WCC, and I'll tell you a few of them that I would like to address. Uh, right now, we do have, it, like we have in all of our institutions, is a contraband problem. And you know, it always bothers me how, if you were in a lockdown facility, how could you possibly have contraband problem? Well, there's there's three ways. You know, they can they can smuggle it in through uh, the they do have uh, family visits that are private family visits. Um, they also uh, have people that work in the mail and uh, packaging area, and they found ways that they can get it done. But they also uh, we do on a very rare occasion occasion have uh, employees of the correction center that smuggle things in. So I would like to see, and this is this came from the tour that the union asked me to go on that was looking at some safety and security issues. Um, when they had the dog, the drug dog there, they, they caught most of the contraband as it came in. It's a $60,000 a year allocation that could really reduce our contraband, contraband issue um, at the state facility. And the other issue is we do have a little bit of overcrowding and some of the wings are a little too old that they really need to be modernized. Um, I was watching uh, one uh, person who was, uh, you know, uh, was incarcerated. There's a one foot wide gap that they uh, have the, the incarcerated people kind of slither in <laughs> to clean windows. I mean, it's really only one foot. It was, it was an older design. WCC was built as a new latest and greatest prison uh, on uh, how to do vocational and technical things. Well, the inmates about four years after its construction burned it down, so they went to more of a maximum security. Um, so they do have uh, some problems at WCC, and I, I do, and I know Drew does visit them regularly. Well, you should make it a requirement for all the new legislators coming in that during the first year they ought to visit at least one of the first. Yeah, they actually open up and they, uh, you know, it's a scheduling issue. The Department of Corrections is actually pretty proactive in inviting people to all the various institutions. And I actually went with Commissioner Shooty, was trying to get him in there. And, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we went through together. But it was under, I always say this, maybe why the, the, the current supervisor, um, he was not the supervisor when I went through there. Um, when I was in prison, they, well, he wasn't in. So. <laughs> but so he ha he has not seen me that I know, but we do we and we've gone through them. So I know there was no yeah yeah on, on the uh, target shooting the designated areas have you picked an area yet and are they away from communities and are you putting in facilities like garbage dumpsters and bathroom facilities so that the land will stay clean. So, first of all, we're going to do. We need to get this legislation done that uh, removes state liability, and then I think um, in working with those that are active at the local level, we'll be uh, we'll be able to cross that bridge next. Well, no. Uh, so there is a, there is a site selection tool criteria that uh, uh, DNR went back uh, to the National Rifle Association site selection criteria team. And they, they have what they believe 
um, is a really good tool for site selection. That would be sound buffers, that would be uh, uh, buffers for, uh, for uh, uh, containment of uh, projectiles going out of the shooting area. Uh, and there will be facilities on site. There probably are not going to be full facilities. There will, there will be um, maintained probably honey buckets, that sort of thing, yeah. and garbage. Um, the good. DNR, when they, we first started talking about this, was talking about several million dollar allocation because it was good, we're going to have to build these fancy toilets and all that kind of stuff. And that's not what we're asking for. We're asking for a safe place to shoot that respects our neighbors um, so we can keep up some of the her heritage things that we've always done. So, so you have a site picked There is a site in Dehulia Forest. <laughs> I know. That, right. uh, that they have three, three sites that, that are on their list. Well, let, me, uh, let me ask you this. Is it close to Herd Road? So I don't know exactly where it is. And I don't believe that it is. Um, I've heard um, your concerns several times about Herd Road. And I guarantee you we will, we will make sure that we come up with a solution that we can all get behind. Or You'll most of us get behind. <laughs> All is a tall order. Yeah. That's a real tall order. Go ahead. I just mostly want to say thank you for the work that you did for getting the Sergeant Moisture House monies so we can get the Sergeant Moisture House done. Thank you for your work. Well, it was our pleasure. I, I, I am speaking for, for Drew, but it, it is going to be an asset to the community. And um, it's taken us a while to get it done. Um, when the request was done the first time, it was out of the capital budget uh, year, and so we, since we only write a full capital budget every two years, we had to wait a little while, but the wait, I think, is going to be worth it. Thank you for that. I would just add on the capital budget side, uh, for those of you that are involved in nonprofits and everything, this is a good year for us to be able to do a lot of the smaller projects yeah. because uh, the total amount of money that we're looking at, potentially for the 35th, is only 200000 which is a lot of money to us, right? But it's in the context of capital projects, it's not a lot of money. So if you're involved with some nonprofits or know some needs in the community, get in touch with our offices because to do twenty and $30,000 projects, those, we can do like 10 of those, and it takes a lot of that backlog off for a lot of organizations. So let us know if those, are, if those needs are out there. Well, go ahead. Hi, Dan, Drew, thanks. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm real, I've uh, been following the Feller issue for quite some time, as you well know. Yeah. And uh, Superintendent Rosenbaugh told me recently that they haven't made much progress with uh, transferring it to WDFW, and I, I don't know that that's ever going to happen. But WDFW said that they would establish some sort of advisory committee. Have you folks heard anything about what's going on there? I, I know of it uh, just in general, and that uh, it came up late in the capital budget process because they, they can't just simply transfer it. Um, even though it's, I, I know how that sounds, but there, there there has to be a transaction that takes place. And so, at the end of the process, it was brought to me too late to be able to move it forward. And it might be something we can do. And I know Dan's a little more familiar on it. So yeah, I, I think what had happened is it was the the request from WD. Or, yeah, anyway, now. Uh, it was too late for this capital budget. So we're kind of on a one-year pause uh, because the capital budget, the full capital budget's written every two years. Uh, as Drew said, the money is pretty dry for those kind of projects uh, in this next capital budget year. But we can certainly uh, hit the ground running and make sure that we expose them all to the fact that we'd like to see that protected in perpetuity uh, and a funding mechanism uh, so we'll be following it closely, and I, I guarantee you there is going to be another public process uh, because all of those purchases have to have a public process. So, um, you know, it'll be a while. It won't be probably as quick as Superintendent Rosenbaum would like to see. Thank you. Yes. As far as the local committee uh, idea is, there's three of us are on the committee and we were called up and asked whether we would serve on the committee, and I said yes. It turns out that we're serving on the Region 6 committee for establishing their 10-year plan, not specifically for Feller. 
and, and you pretend your plan is very slowly moving. Well, watch what you wish for when you say yes. Or what you, watch I, what you get when you say yes. Especially when you have to go all the way to Olympia. Yeah, well, we can see if we get some of them remotely located if you wish. More questions? This will be a pretty short meeting if you don't. Go ahead. Kind of relates to the to the budget, but it also relates to um, a lot of DNR's current policies for the natural resource conservation areas. Um, both you two representatives, thank you very much for introducing your House Bill 1288 last year to try and clarify and improve existing law for the protection of private property rights uh, that may be looking to be tied into these natural resource conservation areas. And one of the things that I would like to see is it never made that a committee last year, but I think the general public needs to realize that um, property should be protected and property values, private property values should be protected, yet also be encouraged to work with wanting to have open borders with your neighbors or other uh, nonprofits and not have the risk of a state agency using that type of a uh, um, sharing relationship as a pedestal for claiming adverse possession by trespassing. So I think your House Bill 1288, we should probably try and, I know there's a lot of people that I have talked to, there's not one private landowner that likes the idea of having to protect their property to the fullest extent or potentially face losing that through adverse possession by public trespass. Yeah, so uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, it's the reason why I ran for this office was to protect private property. I don't think we do a very good job in this state to protect private property. The state's always right. Um, the private property owner is always wrong. That's not what I mean, but that's what uh, it looks like, and that's what it looked like uh, when I decided to run. And in that, uh, the bill is still alive, and it, so it will be reheard. Um, we hope that we can move it further. Senator Sheldon actually had a little bit more momentum than we had. Um, we thought we had a negotiated deal on that, um, but uh, we're taking it to heart. Um, what you guys told us and what you showed us, the video and all of it, um, it makes me tear up. I, I can't imagine a state that would do something like that. Um, I blame actually more the state's legal counsel uh, because the state agencies want to back out of the issue that you're talking about really bad. They want. They want to be 100 miles away from it. So um, I'll let Drew go and then. Yeah, the, um, the chair of the judiciary um, told me afterwards that she was reluctant to move it because of the litigation. And so I'm hoping, and good news, bad news is she's no longer the chair of that committee. It's uh, going to be uh, 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 Kildoff, Representative Kildoff. Um, and, but the bad news is that chair is now the Speaker of the House. So, the, uh, so we might be able to get it out of committee, uh, but we got to work it out for us. Um, yeah. I, I also want to thank you for your time on, on, on supporting this last year, but I think it's important for people in this audience to understand that this isn't about a single litigated right. issue with the state. This is about anybody in the state of Washington that has private property that has ever allowed the public to access their properties for whatever reason, or you seem to be concerned about being close to the public with the shooting range, that they should happen to trespass on your property for any reason. The state cannot take private property through eminent domain. The loophole to this day is they can take it through adverse possession by trespass. So I need to ask you, no compensation. They, they just take it. Now they can't do it through eminent domain. It's the state law prohibits it, which they would have to buy it. They, they don't can't do it, but they can take it through adverse possession by trespass without any payment. You supported it last year. You said there were some technicalities. This is not a single party, single family issue. This impacts every constituent in your jurisdiction as well as the state of Washington. You've had more time, you've had a year. How are you going to help prepare to move this forward in the next legislative session? So sometimes these things take a while. That, that's not a, that doesn't make it any better for, uh, for you right now, but I completely agree with you. And I think having a, as we continue to create awareness amongst that committee and, and continue to, uh, to get people involved on the issue will be the driving force that gets it through. And you're absolutely right. We had a meeting with uh, the lands commissioner and the assistant attorney general over this whole issue. And that was the same argument I gave that, you know, if you have no land and over the course of time, people happen to hunt on a part of it, you can suddenly lose it. Yeah. And 
she didn't appreciate the uh, that assistant attorney general did not appreciate the uh, the analogy because it put a hole into her reasoning. But we're with you, and it, again, I've had some of the simplest legislation take five years, and. and it, it's, it's the nature of the beast. Again, we're working on it. We're going to continue to work on it. And it's getting, when you when you really have an impact is when you have a lot of public testimony. We hear from lobbyists all the time. And it's and you'll notice in the committee, most people, most committee members don't even really pay attention. But when you line up 20 and 30 citizens that are taxpayers and voters, the committee pays attention. And so we've we got to continue to, uh, to drive that. So our first uh, objective uh, going into this next session is get the bill heard again and then get the word out to get a lot of people there and educate that committee. I'm sorry, I'd like to follow up with your discussion with the Attorney General and the Lands Commission, because this is really imperative for them to understand that the precedence that the Attorney General's office may be setting to create new law through judicial review, if they actually are successful at a district court or the state supreme court and taking private property through adverse possession because they just want it for some recreational use this is different than for a road where they can take it to you know the new bypass they're going to be eminent domain property to pay for the owner the property value they're not just taking it for zero dollars like this initial instance is taking place and what they're basing this, the, the current litigation is based upon as well, is that the WDFW has governed our lands with the fishing and hunting regulations. So every private piece of property in the state of Washington is governed under a growth or a game management unit. That is a basis for part of their adverse possession claim. Or if you own tide lands, we're all within a uh, we're Area 12 on the south end of Hood Canal. Every private beach is being governed by a fishing pamphlet. There should never be a precedence of this cooperation between private landowners and the WDFW Fish and Wildlife oversight of our natural resources to give any state agency the right to then adversely take our properties away. Well, you're absolutely right. And I, we are putting a lot into this. this is, Thank you. I don't want Thank you anyone in the room to think that we both collectively, and Tim Sheldon as well, because he ran the Senate Companion, we took it seriously and we're taking it very seriously. There's a lot of people in Olympia that doesn't take it very seriously. A lot of people in Olympia support the policies of taking people's land because they don't believe private landowners actually are doing a good job or have a vested interest in protecting the land. I believe that the private landowner has a, a larger vested interest than the state of Washington does. And, and for everybody here, I want them to know how well they did step forward last legislative section session to represent us. We appreciate that. We really do. And I do know that you are fighting an uphill battle against the, 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 the bureaucrats in Olympia. The land takers. The land takers. The land takers. Yeah. No, I mean, there is a serious problem in Olympia. And it's the real reason I ran for this office, and that there are, there are many in Olympia that think that the government needs to own all the land because we are not responsible with our land. And I'll have to tell you, when we buy land, you look go, the state buys land, you, you fly over it to five or ten years later and look at how it's deteriorated, I will tell you the state does a way worse job managing the lands that we buy than the private landowner that we stole it from. So I, my heart and everything I got is in this. I mean, I, I won't stop. Has it always been that way, that the state could just take your land? So um, in certain circumstances, uh, under adverse possession, uh, no, this would be a newer interpretation, a very new interpretation that uh, that a assistant attorney general has basically pulled out of her hip pocket. But uh, for eminent domain, the state is all, has had that ability because then um, they have to compens compensate the landowner uh, fair market value, and I should think it should be double fair market value. We should also have double indemnity, he says, uh, because of the Bremerton issue where um, par four uh, bought all of that land was taken uh, by the city of Bremerton, where Park Ford and all those auto dealerships were for, for a smell management zone for the sewer system that went in. I'll never forget this. In, in the, the late 80s, a, a little old lady uh, was crying um, on her front porch, holding onto the rail of her front porch as they are taking her out in handcuffs. Oh. 
And do you know what the city of Bremerton did with that land? Sold it at a premium to the Par Auto Group and built a huge auto dealership from. That, that money should have, in double, went back to the trust. That, that's, these things should never happen. So I want everyone to be clear, I'm not a taker. I want to protect uh, uh, and enrich private property ownership rights, and um, I won't stop until I get there. To, to expand on the property ownership issue, hunting. The timber companies are charging fees for, ac for access fees to hunt their properties. There are tons of DNR lands completely surrounded by timber company land, and the warehouser is the one I'm referring to, and I've tried to access the land, and I was told, no, you've got to buy our permit because you're going to walk across our property you need to purchase this permit first, it, and those permits sell out within five minutes of the day that they put them up for sale. So the average person can no longer hunt public lands because they're surrounded by private timber company land. It, you talk about adverse possession, why don't, why don't they take away a strip of land to, allow, to at least allow people to walk into that land and hunt and recreate on it? It's we should be able to, and we'll, we'll address that through legislation then if we need to, that you should be able to aggress through there to get to public lands without having to buy the permit from the private landlord. I fought that with DNR. DNR says, well, we, we, there's nothing we can do about it. We have access only for timber, not for recreation. Sometimes when uh, you're in Olympia, things go really smoothly, and sometimes they don't. So sometimes it feels like, you know those uh, kid toys that you had that it was hard to grab onto, and every time you squeeze it, it would just pop out in another direction. Uh, I try to do a, a no fee, uh, or allow the land, private landowners to collect a nominal fee, an annual fee, so it wouldn't be a, 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 just a hunting fee. It would be, here's the, the problem. Our private landowners now are suffering from the, the litigious nature of the society just like we are. The private landowners now, because they put a gate up and somebody rides a motorcycle into it, now are liable, um, and they're paying out millions and millions of dollars for the, that liability. They're also having to clean up the, the waste that's left over from the recreation. They're asking for an ability to have limited liability immunity, and I want to give them that. And if we do give grant them limited liability immunity, then we can open up our public lands again. That's what we're waiting for. Just by you walking across their land, tripping and breaking your neck, and they're out $50 million, the private landowner has no um, real good reason now why they would want to step up the plate and allow more recreation. But those recreational path corridors, we're talking about how we can come up with a, a buffer zone um, for the total landlocked areas I know pretty much the hunting unit you're talking about, because we talk about it in Olympia all the time. You're not the only hunter that wants to access that land. So we're going to have to find uh, an immunity that allows them to allow people to recreate that then um, they won't be subject to millions and millions of dollars worth of lawsuits either. So it's a balance, and we're working on it. And, and I appreciate that balance, because I'm going to counter the comments from the gentleman here. If, if you, you say that the large timber companies have to provide public access through their lands to get to DNR land, where does it stop to the private property owner who owns 20 acres, 30 acres, or 40 For acres? For their water land? access, too. I mean, it goes on and on. And, I mean, and I'm sorry, so. as a private property land, small private property landowner, I do not want to be forced to allow the public access through my property to get to DNR, which is right next door. There's, there's a distinct difference, though, in the, the timber companies have a preferential tax rate in exchange for yeah. Um, access. Your your land situation is different. You're not a timber company. But it's the, it's the precedence that it sets. Yep. Well, I understand. Can, I think five acres and greater, I can have my my land designated as forestry, the same as the large timber company. So if it's going to be a forestry designation, it just has to be five acres or twenty acres in different different districts. So yeah. that's still really minute when you're looking at you know the three million acres that DNR has checked their border all across the state. Right. There's three million 10 and 20 acre parcels that are going to be encumbered. So 
I understand if there's a warehouser with you know a hundred thousand acre block of land, and then in the center there's fifty thousand acres of state ownership. There should be a easement to get to that because it is state ownership. Yes. Right. But before I go down supporting any adverse possession idea or condemnation of that private property, it, there needs to be an either buy it first, you know, come up with a presentation sure. to purchase it. And if the state can't come up with buying these easements to access our own state land, they shouldn't be trying to be creating any of these natural resource conservation districts where they're competing with our own local conservation districts and asking for us to provide more taxpayer money, create a whole other district of government on top of government to manage something that contradicts DNR's prime mission, which is supposed to be forestry for our schools. Yes. Yep. Amen. Where was it? I mean, really. <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better myself. You got our support. Anybody else? There's a million things we do. No county issues. We'll get there. Education issues. How, how are we doing with school funding issues? Are we funding schools? I'll say this. School funding will always be um, one of the top uh, discussion points in the budget, it always will be. The, uh, we have moved though the needle significantly, doesn't mean that it's done, that's perfect, far from it. Um, we know that. Uh, but we, we are, the, 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 uh, the amount of money going to schools now is over 50% of the state budget. Um, whereas when I came into office, it was I think in the high 30s. Um, we have moved that needle significantly. Um, we, we've got a SEB issue, one of the things that we created through McCleary, which was a set of a uh, separate benefits board for school employees. And that, that, that rollout has been less than spectacular. And uh, I don't feel it was fully addressed in, the, uh, in this last session. So that's something that we need to, we need to fix. Um, and it affects a lot of districts, a lot of school districts within the 35th, especially uh, some of the smaller ones, as well as the ESDs and North Mason. So that's, that's a big issue. Um, but the, um, I, I think we've gotten things on the right trajectory. We're gonna have to make tweaks along the way, things change, and, um, um, but again, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction and have made substantial progress in, in doing that. And, and times change, and, and methods change, and so we have to adapt. Um, we, I think and Dan and I are both strong supporters of so this. We gotta get back to having more career technical education. That's been lost in the last 20 years, um, and, and that's gonna solve a whole host of other issues that we have going on. So we've got our work to do still. Um, there will always be a cry for funding in, in one manner or another. But again, I, I think that overall we've made substantial progress and we're gonna continue to make sure that we're, we're providing the resources that, uh, that we need to. And I don't wanna see McCleary 2.0. And I mean, nobody does. Uh, the, uh, you know, the state, we, we did now pass the, um, the definition of basic education. It'll always be open to interpretation. Everybody's gonna agree. Okay, but the point is that the, the court did agree. And the court, I'll say this, and this is actually my colleague's uh, turn, uh, Representative Stokesbury and I are the appropriations guys in our, in our caucus. And the court isn't, um, isn't right because, we see, I'm gonna screw it up now because I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> How does it say? The court, the court isn't, isn't right because of the court. They're, the Supreme Court is right because they're last. You know, so there's always going to be this tug and this pull between uh, between us and, uh, and the court on some of these issues. But again, I think we are all in all, we're all on the same page, um, and we'll just continue to have to make adjustments. We've got to fix seven in the short term is one of the big ones. And I also say this is too late for uh, uh, for North Mason; they've already built their school. But we've got to fix to the state's allocation of um, of capital resources for new school construction. It's a complicated bureaucracy. And uh, you spend countless hours to get eight, nine, ten percent um, of the state contribution back to your school. Why don't we just cut through the crap and say we're going to give you ten percent of the cost and instead of putting? You have something to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> that eight, nine, ten percent is covered. Um, what it goes to pay actually is the sales tax, right. the construction of the building. We're already a government agency. We're already the money we're paid for is with our. Community yep. taxes. Why are we paying sales tax to build a school to start with? That, that awesome money question. should go directly into the cost of building our schools for our community, and not to pay more state taxes. Yeah, I brought that up, and it was uh, DOA. I because know. I'm with you. So it's Dan. Yeah. I have another question, and maybe you will have the answer because I don't. 
Um, for years, okay. for years, um, we all voted for the lottery years and years ago for the state. You know what I'm going to say? Yeah. What happened to that money? It was supposed to go to school. It does. It does. It all does. of it. And then some. We have 52% of our budget right now goes to K-12 education. Our budget's $54 billion. Billion. We, we uh, raise in the hundreds of millions of dollars for the lottery. So it does. We don't raise billions of dollars to lottery, 16 billion, 17 billion, we don't raise that kind of money. It's in like 100 million, 200 million. That's what we get. So it goes into the general fund, and we write a check to K-12 education in Washington State for, um, it's what, almost 52% of a $54 billion, $56 billion budget? Sorry, it goes up by $2.5 billion every year, so it's hard to catch up, uh, which is too much. I'm being facetious here, but realistically, it does. There, there is no way we could, we could make enough money in the lottery to pay our K-12 debt, let alone our uh, higher education debt. It's impossible. Yep. And so whenever these initiatives come up that they're gonna legalize whatever the next greatest thing is, and they say it's for the kids and all this stuff, that's just, it, there's nothing out there that's ever gonna provide the, the adequate amount for K-12 education, but it does, the money does go in there. It's a couple hundred million dollars. It's the same with marijuana. I mean, it's for the children. Come on. <laughs> Cut through the crap. No, you want to smoke. It has nothing to do with the kids. <laughs> so, but these are, when these initiatives come up, that is always what's sold as. Well, we're going to give it to education. And again, when you're talking $26 billion, show me a program that this, the residents of this state are going to buy into that's going to produce that kind of in income. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I got to go to the marijuana. I do open the door on it. That's fine. Um, because Bill is an unincorporated part of Mason County. Um, I, I think it goes to the county commissioners that are here, but hopefully some state law can help because I struggle going down Highway 3 looking at what, 10, 12, 14 pot shops from here to the high school? Well, there just seems to be more three. And there's another one going in. There's another one going in. And it's like, how much can you have in a one point mile stretch of highway? And there should be some better regulation on how it, it seems to just be too much. And, what is that visual we're giving to our, our middle school and high school kids to going up to the high school, seeing all this every day? How many right, cars so do you see in that same stretch of road? Yeah, a lot of cars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so the, when again, when that initiative was written, uh, it was written to to appease different arguments, and one of it had to do with the, the number of uh, how the distance from from schools, from child care centers, and. The, whole, the places that you can do that most effectively are in rural areas, and then combine that with this is a non incorporated area, so there's one less level of bureaucracy there. Um, this is a big issue in a number of counties throughout the state that it's not just us that, that see that. So, um, again, it, a lot of it has to do with the way the initiative was written, and in order to make all those uh, lines work with how far you have to be from everything, rural areas typically it's easier to accommodate that. Um, and I'm, the rural areas of the forgotten stepchildren, because I don't know how Shelton deals with it, but it seems like there is a, a disservice here in Belfair, and there's an elementary school between here and the high school. Why couldn't this go into the industrial areas? Why is it going on the main highway, the main highway, not some of the off-roads? And I guess this is for the commissioners. It, it's just something to think about. I don't think it does our children a service. Right. We're not, I'm not opposed to smoking marijuana, not that I do, but I, when my kid asks me, Dad, why is there so many um, of these, these, these little emblems, these green crosses? What do these mean? And there's three to one to our coffee shops on the same section of road. I mean, we don't have three in this community. I think there's a new one being built up here on top of Cross Street JR's, our, our HD's and Gwen's Tavern. I think there's two or three in this lower section, another one up on the hillside uh, above the auto. I think we have five within a half mile block of the main arterial for Belfer. Now, it's nothing that we could probably do now, but I'd, I'd hate to see 15 more. I mean, my kid, my kids wanted to know, what do we do with all this pot? And, well, the good news on not wanting to see more is all of the permits that are have been issued have been issued. So right now, to get a permit to start another business, you're going to have to buy it from somebody that already owns that license. So we, in essence, pretty much have reached saturation. Um, local zoning, I try to stay out of, but uh, when you mentioned industrial lands, we don't, we have a big a shortage of industrial lands in the North End. 
That's why it is so important that we get this development off the ground. We get the, the Highway 3 freight corridor off the ground, which is a better na name than the Belfair Bypass because it's really what it's, it's doing. But it, it's going to help us open up a lot of land that we can leverage for a lot of good things for our community. Um, so I try to stay out of local zoning and let uh, all of the local folks argue with their local electeds on zoning. Uh, but when it comes to it, our, uh, the permits have been issued and there's no more to buy unless you buy it from somebody that owns them. So I guess, can I go again? <laughs> sure. So this is going to tie into my, my last... Um, the real reason. The, yeah, the actual reason why I was actually coming to actually talk this afternoon. And it relates it to, you know, your private property rights, but also being a steward of your private property. That's one of the things that I see that there is a lot of in the North Mason area is you have a lot of landowners that are privately owned that are great stewards. And because you're a great steward, we have the beautiful environment that we live in. But when it comes to, there is also several, uh, there's a difference between being a steward and wanting to maximize return and still being a good steward. I, I've gone back and forth quite extensively over a proposal that was going to be taken, that was trying to gain momentum on North Shore Road until I really dove into it. And it goes to your actual permitting and local jurisdiction over uh, developments with, you know, not getting in turn, you know, not getting into the local zoning regulations. I personally feel that there should also be oversight to make sure that the local districts are actually doing the permitting appropriately. They may be understaffed or uneducated on certain issues through SEPA or environmental impact studies and review or historical knowledge of whatever it may be. But a prime example is what I'm referring to is a proposed project that was looking to take place on the canal that was a 100-year gravel pit for 100 truck and trailers a day, and it's literally just five miles down the road, which doesn't fit as being a steward of the property. I believe we are in a shortage of great sand and gravel. This is where my dilemma comes in. I believe we need to have uh, great uh, environmental review before we start just mining gravel, and it needs to be done in areas where it's going to be the most protective to the environment and to the neighboring community. And a gravel pit of this size and magnitude, which I do not know if you're even familiar of, I am. should never have gotten the momentum to where it is today, which is still a direct threat, of uh, coming in, potentially manipulating the actual current zoning, which is rural residential five, into trying to tie it into a resource a rural resource gravel mine without going through the proper processes to protect the community at the large and the environment. And so as this moves forward, this goes into our local community and our local, um, you know, Mason County oversight to making sure that if a gravel pit is being proposed here, that all the boxes are checked off, that the community and the surrounding neighborhood and the environment is going to be protected. It's not just going to be well, we mined gravel some 60 years ago out here, dumped it in the canal to fill in homes, which one of them might even be my own before I was born. But those were the rules back then. These are the rules today. And we need to make sure that if we move forward, let's get the right environmental processes in place, make sure that they're followed to protect this resource. If it can be mined, I'm an advocate for mining. I'm just an advocate for stewardship of the land and stewardship of your neighbors and mining appropriately. So, yes, I don't know what else to say other than, yes, we have to be very diligent when we're talking about our precious resources, that is our waterways. Uh, we haven't done as good a job uh, as we could, but we're doing a great job now. We are certainly making leaps and bounds, uh, strides ahead. We're not gonna fix um, 200 years of the uh, way we did things uh, overnight. Um, that, but I'm, that local review process and the state SEPA process those things are quite arduous and rigorous. I don't know if anybody, anybody ever um, tried to fill out a SEPA report. I did on a couple of just uh, businesses that I kind of made up um, just to see what the process was like. It's pretty arduous. Um, in that, I believe the local community has the best say. 
I don't want the state agencies coming in and saying, no, we are going to take over your local zoning because that happens way too much. You have local elected officials. It's easier here to have input because you have three to talk to. So um, be patient, stay the course, be loud, uh, and expect what you expect, and talk to your local elected officials. We live at uh, mile marker five, which is right across the street from this proposed um, gravel mine. And there's, it, it started last year in July when um, there was a small notice to a small number of neighbors who got notice that there was this proposal. And within a very short period of time, um, Mason County, uh, got 250 letters from the surrounding neighbors saying, wait a minute, this doesn't look right. And, and so we have um, worked really hard to try to make sure that the SEPA application that was from last year, um, which had a lot of problems, um, anyway, they wound up withdrawing their application for this gravel mine. But I think that things are still moving along. Um, and, and as a neighbor, the impact of any kind of a mining activity up on the hill, where it's going to have you know, washed down into the canal. I mean, they are really right close to where the water is across the street. Um, is a huge, huge concern. The noise, the, the traffic, um, the Department of Transportation said North Shore Road cannot sustain that kind of heavy, heavy equipment traffic. Um, DOE and DNR are all involved. And, um, and we're just very concerned as North Shore neighbors. And your South Shore neighbors should be equally as concerned because they would be the ones looking across at this scarred hillside and the sound would probably pass over my house and bounce over to yours um, would be would be a terrible. So um, we're working really hard to to try and um, make sure that our county commissioners are working um, and listening and, and understanding. We talk to many of them, and uh, we just want you guys to know what's going on on our behalf as well. Yeah, appreciate it. To me, I mean, it sounds like the process is working. I mean, you know, they, they've withdrawn. It doesn't mean it's totally dead. But if, if they, they've withdrawn the application. But they, uh, but they mined for, for a couple of days anyway. Yeah, they yeah. still don't mine. In April, without any permits, April of this year, they withdrew their application at the end of the period for public comment last July. Okay. April 1st, they moved equipment in. Um, and over the course of 10 days, just when they were just taking out gravel. And um, there was an estimated 7,000 yards based upon aerial photos and then today's current condition that was um, either wrongfully excavated or illegally excavated. Either way, it should never have been excavated. Trying to set a precedence is reopening an abandoned gravel pit and potentially circumvent today's regulations that we'd be following. And that's a serious problem because the SEPA, I read the SEPA, and the SEPA was fatally flawed. It didn't address side access to the pit. It's entering a blind corner next to a school bus loading an unloading spot next to the Port of Allen's boat ramp, which everybody's already unloading boats onto a blind corner. So we have the road problem. They didn't identify any of the hydrology concerns for stormwater runoff. They didn't identify any of the noise pollution control. There was no mitigation plan for the existing roads when the state DOT even said that the roads would probably be completely torn apart and the Union Bridge is about ready to be needing replacing anyway. There was just a whole list that was never ever checked off yet at the county level, all mitigated determination of non-significance, let's go ahead and proceed to the next step. It should have been stopped right then. And it wasn't just because I believe um, it's based upon the owner of the property to fill it out accurately. And if they don't, it's not the county's responsibility to verify if they're either lying or not accurately filling out the seat because they're just uneducated. It's the landowner or the consultant that does that. And they make mistakes. So how do we check and balance this without spending 
a bunch of time and energy and resources privately or collectively from the county. I mean, and then when they come in and they start illegally mining or taking the gravel, you kind of start to put the picture that, okay, well maybe the SEPA was directly tied to these operations because here's this activity taking place when they shouldn't have been doing it. So there's a concern here that's not feeling right. Okay. I, I would just like to piggyback on that if I may, because while the local zoning is a county issue, the, the mining permit is either a federal permit or a state permit. It's or it's, both. It's, it, it, so, so this is where the state does need to be involved, and so does the federal government, because what has happened here, the Shoreline Management Act is not a county act, it's a state act. Critical areas, hazard areas and steep slopes, aquifer protection and water quality, um, site distance and traffic controls maybe are a state or county issue, but they're also state standards because this is partly a state or a state highway and then a county highway. There's a whole lot that the state needs to be aware of here, a whole lot that was ignored, and the loophole was 60 years it was an active gravel pit. They did not continuously keep that active over 60 years. It sat dormant for well over 20, 25 years, and they're using a loophole and ignoring SEPA. This is huge. We'll look into it. Thank you. Yep. To, to piggyback on, on the Union River Bridge comment, I, and I brought this up with the county, I brought it up with DOT, and everybody blows me off on it. But the Union River Bridge is a wooden structure that they threw asphalt over the top of it. Go underneath it. It's all creosote beams holding up that bridge. Sooner or later, that bridge is going to go. And when that bridge goes, all of the peninsula, all the traffic, we all got to drive an extra 15 miles just to go to the one road. I mean, it's something, it's a state problem because it's a state highway. It's something the state needs to address and sue before okay. that bridge goes away. It floods out it, every time we have a big storm. There's a foot or two feet of water over the top of the bridge. And that actually goes to what some have been working on with the transportation, local transportation committee here, TIPCAP, is that there was a proposal there where Sand Hill, the intersection of Sand Hill Road to our elementary school, is also on another blind corner. And my own daughter was hitting a school bus while she was riding it there uh, as a combination of over speeding and then also the flooding that we see in the wintertime between that section of North Shore Road and the Union River Bridge. I've lived on my property for 16 years. I've seen the road shut down four times, like because it's flooded, like literally over the bridge, the 07, 2010. There needs to be some capital budget spent on improving and getting some funds through for the state and maybe even the county to improve that entire section of the road. It is dangerous there. Well, that being the transportation budget, and yeah, we certainly have to advocate for it. You know, that's that's one of the many issues that we've got to change to in our state. You know, when the Skagit River Bridge collapsed, that they had that thing permitted and rebuilt in six months. When it's when it's a crisis, they'll they'll do it. You know, because they waived all the BS that they put everybody through. So same thing with the well, Columbia River Bridge. Yeah, they won. it was yeah. a miracle the way they rebuilt it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm on the Peninsula Regional Transportation Organization, and WashDOT gave a little report, and they they do have North Shore. Highway 300 scheduled for redoing part of it, or at least right. it's ADA compliant, so that means they're going to fix it. But I just want to give you a heads up, they're going to work on it. I just heard Herb's comment to a river bridge. I live in that area when the bridge went out, the old bridge. And it went out because of the storm that came in in 2007 or something, which lifted all the habitat in the river, all the fish habitat, that wouldn't allow us wouldn't allow people to remove it because it's for the fish. So when all that got lifted, went down the river to the bridge, it built up and then it really washed the bridge out, flooded everybody out on one of the roads. A couple people actually wound up in the river. But the thing is, it took more than six months for them to come and fix that bridge. They actually built a brand new one, which cost over a million dollars. So that might be something to look at because it's cheaper now to replace it than to wait down the road when this thing goes out because it'll, it'll go out. It's right. just a matter of time. We've been here 30 years and we were stranded in there three three different times. So let's just about okay. get to the River Bridge. <laughs> so it would be, again, because uh, we're on a biennium budget, uh, major projects, 
um, would be, it won't be in this coming session, it would be in the following year, but it's good to know these things now so we can begin to work on them and get them primed for uh, 21. Anyone else that have a chance to? <laughs> Nobody's going to speak up. What about the regular budget of the state? The, what, from my point of view, the state is always spending way more than they have. They, now we're in it, in the golden years where we're making money, they get more tax money, and then they pass bills that, that spend more than what they're bringing in. What's going to happen when the economy turns down? You can't support what you guys have, have committed to. Well, we voted no. Well, <laughs> I can tell you that. And I strongly advocated against this budget. I mean, it's a, we could have increased spending 14% without changing the tax structure, and they chose to change the taxes in the dead of the night, pass um, title-only bills that have no substance to them, pass those out of committee, and then bring it to the floor with no language in the bill, amend it on the floor, and increase your taxes at 1 in the morning, and add another $10 billion over the next four years. And that's what happened in the final days of the session. It was wrong. It's a $54 billion budget. It spends every last dime. It has a $100 million ending fund balance, which is nothing. That would be the equivalent of somebody making $100,000 a year saving $200 for an emergency. What emergency are you going to buy with that? But that is the position that this state has put itself in. We are in no position to weather a downturn. They've tapped the rainy day fund for non-rainy day type things. They circumvented the, uh, um, when we have extraordinary revenue, it's supposed to go into the rainy day fund. They circumvented it. It, uh, it might have passed the letter of the law, but it did not pass the spirit of the law. And the, this is the mismanagement that has happened here in the last two years, and it's atrocious. And I will continue to, to advocate against this type of uh, budgetary process. Because when we get the downturn, guess what gets cut? It's all the stuff you need when you're in a recession. It's all the safety nets. It's all the job retraining. That's the only thing you can cut because we're, we're mandated by so many things. You can't cut the prisons. You know, it, it's, we have a number of federal programs where we're tied into it, we can't cut them, and so we end up having to cut the very things that are most needed in a recessionary time. And the state has put itself in a horrible position. Um, and if we don't start writing this, um, we'll have a supplemental budget this year, they better not spend any more. And then when we go into the next biennium budget, we better do it right. What do you say? Don't <laughs> <laughs> spend more, trust me. Uh, it, well, it depends on who um, is in the speaker's chair. It really does. It doesn't have to be that way. Washington can decide that they want to be a little more fiscal, fiscally conservative, and other people can occupy the chair. Unfortunately, we've had um, one party on the executive branch for over 35 years. And what you see with that is in most states you'll see an ebb and flow. Eight years one party, four years another party. And when that happens, good things happen. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. The good thing that happens is you hire all new department heads. There's a refreshed energy in all the state departments to do it a, a, a different way. The reason that we didn't build more lane miles, which is what we desperately needed to do, was because Governor Locke went to a conference and decided, wow, this multimodal thing will move people more. So if we put everybody in a transit, then they don't stop driving on the roads. Did that work? But just the governor, that governor, that many years ago, has had such a ripple effect that us right now trying to catch up to the fact that what we really should have been doing all those years is building roads. We lost that because one governor decided, wow, I'm gonna change the mission, we'll use my executive power and change the mission of Washington State DOT. Instead of a congestion relief and freight mobility, it's, well, something that's a lot more convoluted than that. Drew, Dan, you know, they say all politics is local. And you guys coming here in force today, our little community, you showed that this little local community counts and matters to you. I want to point out to everybody as a thank you for coming here today that this is not an election year. They are here to hear you now because you wanted to talk to them now. And I really, really appreciate this little town got dual force out here to hear us out. So I want to thank you personally for coming to our little community. <laughs> You can't take North Mason out of the boy, Randy. I'm sorry. You know that as well. I mean, I grew up here. I graduated in 89. You're not getting rid of me. So I will always be local, and I will always be humble for all of you. I appreciate it, though. Anyone else?
No, thanks. I really do appreciate it. And the, the comments and the concerns you have, it's important to hear them. We might not have the answers today, uh, but it's important that we take those back and, uh, and work on them. So really do appreciate that. And uh, it, it is an honor to serve you. And don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime, and we'll, uh, we'll keep moving forward together. Thank you.